right. Um, should I just get started? OK. Give everyone a OK. <clears throat> OK. Um, so I guess we'll get started. I have, of course, the dubious, uh, although in my case, self-inflicted uh, dubious uh, wound of speaking right after lunch. Um, uh, but I, and I apologize in advance that I will make a rather dramatic exit as soon as I'm done speaking, as I have to get to the State Department to talk to some people there about using precision-guided tools to deal with one of the countries that we focus on. Um, so the, my presentation, in some ways, is really to pick up where I think a lot of the morning got to, which is, <clears throat> again, as uh, Mike uh, used the term war on the, the, the revenue, war on the money, uh, and, you know, a lot of the different presentations talked about really coalesced around the idea of uh, focusing on the ways we can analyze, map, understand the illicit networks and the illicit revenue flows. And so the question really then becomes, uh, what do we do about it? And, uh, and how do we, and then how, and how do we get it done? So I will um, talk about, in, in some ways, just kind of as a, uh, oh, I don't have the, the clicker for the slides. Um, the um, I kind of walk through kind of a litany of the tools that exist. Thank you. Oh, not working. always there's an on button I am not focused on. So um, thank you. So just a quick note of background uh, to explain sort of why I'm talking about these things. I um, have done a few different stints in the private sector, working at law firms, uh, doing sanctions and money laundering compliance. Uh, I spent three and a half uh, years in, at the Treasury Department in the Office of the Chief Counsel for OFAC. Uh, working on sub-Saharan African sanctions programs from sort of the end of 2005 to the beginning of 2009. And then I went to the State Department uh, and worked for four and a half years on, uh, as uh, I used to glibly refer to my title, the Special Advisor for People Fighting Over Rocks. Uh, I worked on the Kimberley process for conflict diamonds, conflict minerals, uh, and sort of the illicit, illicit natural resources. Um, <clears throat> and so intersected with a lot of the really what at the time were developing tools and developing approaches to this. Uh, I think what's interesting is while, as some have referenced, we've been, you know, these are issues that have been with us since biblical times and probably before that, uh, really it is only now in the last few years that we are developing the right kinds of tools and approaches that can uh, really start to make a difference. Um, <clears throat> to st I showed the video before that kind of gets at what we do uh, at the Enough Project in the Century, and certainly there are other NGOs, uh, Global Witness uh, in particular, that do a lot of the, the effort to gather uh, information and gather intelligence about what is going on in a particular place. Uh, the Enough Project was founded 10 years ago uh, to focus on, the tagline is still, a project to end genocide and crimes against humanity. For eight years, the, the organization really focused on this sort of traditional approach to those issues, political processes, human rights, peacekeeping, peace processes. Uh, and a couple of years ago, the organization really stepped back and said, uh, it's not working. It's not working to just advocate for human rights and democracy. It's not working to simply wait for the political processes and peacekeeping operations to, 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 um, uh, to make things better on the ground and to prevent genocide, at least in the region that we focus on. So the question was, what will make a difference? How do we make this change that we are, at this point, failing to achieve? And really, the analysis came back to, in these countries, as in many of the other places that we've talked about today, you have networks that have taken control of some or all of either a government, a region, an opposition party, and are working to use <clears throat> to maintain power and control through uh, through financial means. And so if we can disrupt 
those financial networks and disrupt the ways that they're able to do that, then we, from our interest and our perspective, I mean, I think the broader goal of the conference around the broader approach to national security is, you know, raises a whole range of different questions. For us, it's how do we get these regimes, how do we get people like Salva Kiir, uh, President Kabila, to, uh, to be willing to come to a table, come to a table and, and change their behavior through a diplomatic process so that we don't need what's happening uh, this morning in Zimbabwe. Uh, we don't need tanks to roll in and uh, displace a regime that has well overstayed its power. Um, a few, I think, principles that go into the concept of using precision-guided treasury tools. Uh, and we did a, a short policy brief in June called Yes, We Have Leverage, uh, which you can find on our website. And a lot of our investigations have shown a few kind of consistent things, which is one, that there are often um, facilitators, enablers that are working with perpetrators on the ground. You do not, although a lot of our effort focuses in on Salva Kiir, President Kabila, their <clears throat> immediate family, they rely on systems. They rely on uh, systems of corporate ownership, corporate networks, banks, legal uh, lawyers who are uh, navigating uh, the financial system for them to enable um, enable them to continue to enrich themselves. And we find, uh, in many cases, they work, if not entirely, very uh, predominantly in dollars. Uh, that may change, and there are risks to sort of overemphasizing the fact that dollars is the currency of trade. But for now, and certainly in the region that we work on, most of this happens in dollars, which means <clears throat> um, in many, if not most cases, that financial transactions of those dollars are going to pass through New York, maybe for a millisecond through uh, what is called correspondent banking services. That hook is really, in many cases, the precision-guided tools that I'll, I'll run through, ma many of them were developed around uh, the effort to get the Iran nuclear deal signed. And the pressure that developed over several years by Stuart Levy and, uh, and, and uh, a massive team at Treasury really hinged on the idea that, that the money that was involved crossed into New York for a moment and therefore provided the US government with jurisdiction over those funds and the banks through which that money was passing. Um, that's a key part of all of this in terms of at least the, the jurisdiction to make these tools effective. Because of that, uh, when you deal in sub-Saharan Africa, um, and I've, you know, a lot of our work is collecting that intelligence, putting it into packages and dossiers, and then turning it over to people like Kellen uh, and OFAC and state and to banks directly. There was reference earlier to public-private partnerships. We do a lot of work where we'll collect banking information and contracts, et cetera, and give it to banks so that they're aware of it. Uh, and in many cases, we find certainly in the foreign policy world, uh, awareness of how the financial system works is not, uh, should not be a given. Uh, that we have been in many briefings where we're talking to senior foreign service officers about what's happening. We keep referring to dollars and we've been stopped and they say, why do you keep talking about dollars? These are people who are in Congo. We can't get to them. They're in Congo. Uh, and, you know, we have to say that's it's a very narrow way of looking at it. They are in Congo. Their money is crossing through here. You have authority over it. And, you know, people who are who spend their lives in the AF world at the State Department don't take the courses on the financial system uh, the way others do. So it is an important, I think, role that our work, uh, our here generally, a lot of the organizations in the room, to explain how these financial systems work uh, and where those tools can come into play. So I'm going to then skip ahead and say, okay, so if we take the idea that there are networks working. Um, that they are working through companies, through facilitators, uh, and that their money is coming through here, at least perhaps momentarily, or if it's going through Europe, the Europeans have many of these tools, what, what can we do about it? Um, there are a few different sort of categories of tools that uh, are important to, to note. And before I start getting into this, um, how much time do I have left? I forgot to set my, my clock. Four minutes, my lord. Uh, okay, um, I will have to be precision guided in my ref uh, discussion of precision guided tools. Um, five, okay, wow, twenty percent more. Um, can I can I bid for six while I'm at it? No. Um, so, 
Let me start with, uh, I think, what people tend to think of in this realm are sanctions. Uh, and the world of sanctions is a very fascinating and, and uh, one that has undergone a really massive revol revolution in the last 10 years. Uh, and I think what are the important things to note about sanctions um, are that we have done a couple of things. One, we being the US government, and I think other governments as well, have started to look at, first, things we can do with sanctions that are not freezing somebody's assets and putting them on a list. Um, we have started to work on secondary sanctions, sectoral sanctions. Sectoral sanctions were developed principally around uh, Russia and Ukraine, uh, and identifying whole sectors of an economy, whole sectors of the Russian economy in this case, uh, and saying anyone doing business in these sectors could potentially face sanctions. And we're not talking about niche, minor ca categories, mining, energy, banking, massive parts of the Russian economy and therefore massive parts of the global economy. Um, the sanction that we impose becomes not we're going to freeze assets of massive parts of this economy, but we're going to limit the financing that, though, that entities working in those sectors can get access to, down to 30 days, of <clears throat> 30 days of credit to be extended in this kind of transaction, 60 days in this kind of transaction. In the Venezuela sanctions, if people have followed that, the Venezuela executive order is a f and the Venezuela sanctions are incredibly detailed and get into incredible minutia about what kind of transactions can happen with which companies through the US financial system. Not that we're going to freeze out everything that's happening in Venezuela, but we really, again, are precision guided in saying we can figure out which are the nodes of the Venezuelan economy that need to be affected and how we can do it. Um, as things go, these kinds of sanctions are more and more critical to be, uh, to be used and to develop. Secondary sanctions are another uh, where the idea is identifying foreign financial institutions, banks in Europe or banks in China or banks in Israel, um, that may be doing business with, in, with, uh, in illicit sectors that the US finds problematic. And again, the issue isn't we are shutting down that bank, but rather we are going to pick from a menu of potential sanctions. The inability to access US government procurement, uh, limitation on the kinds of correspondent relationships that are, uh, that are allowed. It's important to understand that when we think about sanctions, we start to move away from putting people on a list only. When we do put people on a list, we need to be putting people on lists uh, with their networks, with companies, with their enablers, in, in larger swaths than we have done before. Again, to enable these, when banks start to use sanctions and start to implement them, that they are given the information they need in order to, um, to implement them and enforce them effectively. A um, couple more, the, I do want to mention one more word on the global Magnitsky law, which we talked about a little bit today. Here's another evo really dramatic evolution in the way sanctions can be developed and applied. Rather than simply looking at sort of country by country threats, looking at the issue of corruption at a, as a global threat. And the law allows Treasury, and it, as you heard, we'll be doing so hopefully in a few weeks, to designate for asset freeze, visa bans, et cetera, uh, those who are engaged in acts of significant public corruption. This is a massive potential tool. Um, it also targets those who uh, are guilty of human rights violations for attacking human rights defenders, the sort of two categories that fall under the global Magnitsky rubric. How this unfolds and how this evolves could really have a massive impact on uh, the way we approach these issues. And again, how precision guided we can be in, because it has to be global, we're only ever gonna see targets, a few targets per region to, in order to, to, so that they can keep a balance and not have a list that has millions of people on it. So gathering the intelligence to say, if we can identify these two or three key people in this region, we can start to have the impact on corruption that the global Magnitsky law is designed to have. Um, it is critical that we continue to develop the, this kind of intelligence and information as NGOs and as uh, other investigators to enable Treasury to be able to do that. Um, quickly, um, talk, any money laundering. Uh, any money laundering, um, 
is uh, there was testimony given a few months ago by a former Treasury official who, had, who noted that really we are seeing FinCEN, the, the U.S. Financial Intelligence Unit uh, called the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, start to use its tools. Its mandate to stop money laundering is really evolving and developing into the foreign policy realm and really taking on almost a sanctions-esque uh, approach to how, when, and where it's being used. If you look at uh, the range of tools that FinCEN has had, in some cases since the 70s, since the Bank Secrecy Act, oh my lord, I did set it, um, uh, and more recently since the Patriot Act, tools that have been on the books for 15 or 30 years that are only now being understood very, very quickly. FinCEN has the ability to do a few key things that are really important for us uh, in this uh, world. Section 314A of the Patriot Act allows FinCEN to send essentially investigative requests to upwards of 22,000 banks, identifying names of individuals and companies that are uh, of people that are suspected of being connected to money laundering. Usually it is uh, a law enforcement tool. The FBI or others will send to FinCEN. These are the names. Uh, but FinCEN has the ability to do this itself. Uh, it's not public. Uh, we don't know who those names are, but banks will tell you that this is a key piece of information for them to get to, to understand uh, who they need to be looking at. <clears throat> Advisories uh, are general comments by FinCEN on patterns of money laundering they are seeing uh, in recent months on South Sudan and Venezuela. Pretty massive, breathtaking advisories on patterns of corruption that they see with respect to, to these countries. And you can get the sense that this may be an area that they're going to continue to evolve in. Um, and there's not a specific hook to it. It just encourages banks to do due diligence and file suspicious activity reports. Uh, but the ability to get the international financial system aware of corruption in South Sudan or Venezuela is critical. Lastly, Section 311, which is maybe the most well-known of FinCEN's tools, the ability to designate a primary money laundering concern. A perfect example of where FinCEN has not even begun to scratch the surface of its tools. A primary money laundering concern can be declared, and that can be a country, it can be an institution, it can be a class of transactions, it can be an account, it can be whatever FinCEN wants. FinCEN has only ever used it to declare a country or a bank, a primary money laundering concern. There are whole categories of primary money laundering concerns that they haven't used. Similarly, when uh, a money laundering concern is declared, they have five special measures to choose from, uh, from just enhanced due diligence and record keeping requirements all the way to cessation special measure five, which is cessation of correspondent banking requirements, meaning US financial institutions have to stop correspondent relationships with that concern. That's the only one they've ever used only ever use Special Measure 5. So the idea of how we can use these tools, again, more precision guided, let's pick specific transactions, classes of accounts, uh, and then let's see what happens when there is just a record keeping requirement. How does that change and how does that disrupt the way these networks work? Uh, we're still not there yet, even though these laws have been, this law has been on the books for 16 years. Um, sorry that I rambled too much at the beginning. I'm well over time. Uh, I'm. Uh, Again, a lot of what I was saying and a lot of the tools that we've worked on are in this brief, yes, we have leverage, uh, and I will certainly be around after I come back uh, to talk about questions, et cetera. So thank you again for the opportunity to, uh, to speak today.